why don't we start there? And th this story uh, about someone being arrested, um, China denies it, of course, for spying um, on behalf of China. When you see stories like that, and there's been others uh, of this ilk um, with things like police, um, shadow police systems across the country, do you change your previously warm, pragmatic view of China? Well, my view of China has always been that we should approach China with our eyes wide open. Um, you know, it's not a surprise to me this morning, and I hope it's not a surprise to um, many people, that China is spying on us. Uh, many people are spying on us, and when we catch them out doing it, we need to be robust in our response, as we are when we find spies from Russia or Iran or any other country. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should cut trade and investment ties, that we should simply go into a defensive crouch. Ch China is a fact of life. It's the world's second largest economy. It's our fourth largest trading partner. And we've got to work out how we live with China, deal with China uh, in a way that is appropriate, given the level of challenge that China represents to us. Challenge uh, in terms of values, uh, challenge in terms of, uh, of direct um, threat to our national security interests, and we have to take a rounded view. I don't think it helps just to say, we've caught them out with a spy, um, therefore we have to cancel everything. That's not the way to secure our best long-term national interest. I I'm interested though, because there's been quite a cumulative set of instances, whether it's stealing of IP when it comes to business relations, this spying story that we've got now, being designated uh, as hu committing human rights abuses and, and committing genocide. I mean, there's quite a lot here. So I just wonder where you think we, we draw the line and whether for the early part of your time in government under the, the sort of Cameron era on into the Theresa May era, we were too friendly. We were perhaps a little bit blinded to all of this. Well, I don't think we were blinded, but we were trying to rebuild uh, a relationship that had gone into the deep freeze. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of the coalition government, relations with China were simply broken off uh, because of the Dalai Lama uh, visit. And um, after a period when we had frozen relations with China, there was an attempt to rebuild um, the dialogue in order to try to shape and influence a little bit, not let's be realistic about how much we can do that, but in also, also in order to build um, trade and investment links. The UK is a medium-sized economy. China's the world's second largest economy. It is a fact of life. We've got to deal with it. We don't have the luxury of saying um, we simply, we're going to cut all links with China. Would you go as far to call them a foe or an adversary, or do you understand if the government doesn't go that far? No, I think China is a challenger, uh, and we should be absolutely clear about that, a strategic challenger to the UK. And China will be doing things like spying on us, which other nations also do, and which, you know, bluntly, we do as well. Um, we've got to be realistic and grown up about this. When we catch them out doing it, um, we have to be robust in our response. But we also have to ask ourselves, where were the authorities um, when it came to the vetting process mm -hmm. um, that would let somebody working for a, uh, a challenger power uh, so close to the heart of our parliamentary democracy. Of course, that person arrested on suspicion at the moment, not, not uh, nothing confirmed. Let's move on and talk about the, the economy, Lord Hammond. And um, last week on Sky with Sophie Ridge, Andy Haldane said that with the benefit of hindsight, the Bank of England did a little bit too much uh, for a little too long in terms of loose policy leading into the inflation that we've got now. I, I wonder whether you'd make a similar assessment uh, of the Treasury during the period of the last three or four years, particularly through the pandemic. Do you think the extent of the stimulus was a little overdone and has contributed to the inflation we see today? Well, to start with, of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I agree with Andy Haldane on monetary policy. Um, but I also uh, agree with what you've just suggested there, that I think fiscal policy was too loose um, for too long. I'm not sure whether that was driven by the Treasury or by Number 10 um, during that period. Um, because I wasn't inside government. Um, but I do think it was right at the beginning of the COVID crisis to take a precautionary approach and to throw the kitchen sink at the problem because we didn't know how big it was going to be. But once it was clear that we were going to get COVID under control through um, the use of vaccines and treatments and that the economy would survive um, the COVID crisis, I do think we went on being too generous 
for too long. And the evidence is clear. We were more generous um, than any other uh, large economy in our um, uh, support for businesses and citizens. That did allow pent-up demand to be accumulated during the COVID period, which manifested itself as soon as we unlocked in September 21 mm -hmm. in the early stirrings of inflation. And I think some of the problems we've had in the UK economy are due to that overstimulus. But the thing we also shouldn't forget is that even if we get through the effect of overstimulus, so we get inflation back in the box, and in a couple of years' time, we've dampened that particular problem down. We did also, of course, borrow an extra £600 billion, which is now sitting on our national debt and having to be serviced at a time when interest rates are much higher. So that is creating a recurring year-on-year -year problem of... F f f sorry about that. That's the Chancellor of, calling um, to say, stop criticising yeah, Yes, me. exactly. Um, of um, a, a continual recurring problem um, with our fiscal deficits that we've now got to fund a much larger annual cost of supporting... How, how big a problem debt. is that? Now that we have positive real rates, is it going to cripple us? Well, it's not, it's not going to cripple us, but it is going to mean that a bigger proportion than anybody would like of the taxes that we raise and the money that we borrow is being spent on interest rather than on schools, hospitals and defence. Mm -hmm. I, I want to touch as well on uh, the other big economic story of the day, the, the revisions that we've seen of late um, that show the UK actually recovered quite a lot quicker than originally thought. What, what, what did you make of the scale of that revision? Uh, it was quite surprising, I have to say, and very pleasing. I mean, obviously means we're in a better position than we thought we were. Um, all early estimates of GDP are estimates. And I think what we're seeing here is a, um, a fact that the ONS is better at estimating the effect of demand shocks than it is at estimating the effect of supply shocks, which is what the, um, the COVID uh, crisis largely was. Um, so it's, it's, it's good that we find that, that, that our economy is a bit bigger um, than we thought it was. Um, but the point remains that we have a significantly larger debt to contend with as we go forward. And growth is still much slower than we would like it to be. And that's about primarily about productivity. We have to get productivity growing again. We have to get the UK labour market functioning again. D does that revision mean that your view of Brexit has changed? Has Brexit been less negative than you previously thought for the UK economy? So I be I've always believed that Brexit would be and has proved to be a negative impact on the UK economy. But it's not the only negative impact. Obviously, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, um, the COVID crisis and the, consequential, uh, the consequentials of that have also had a significant negative um, impact on the UK economy. So we are battling on at least three fronts um, at a time. And by the way, the um, disintegration of global trade um, uh, driven by the US-China um, falling out uh, has also affected mm -hmm. the UK because we're, a, we're a, an open economy and a trading nation. We're, we're pretty much, Lord Hammond, a one-year anniversary of the uh, Trust Quateng budget. Yes. And, and I wondered whether looking back on it, you thought it just was a temporary blow to the UK economy or has it done lasting damage? Um, I, I think it was a temporary blow. I don't think it's done lasting damage to the economy. I think it's done some lasting damage to our reputation. Um, it's, it's one of a series of events that have called into question the UK's um, reputation for stability, uh, economic and political stability. Um, but I think something very interesting happened in the autumn budget of last year. Um, the markets bit back. And I think for some time, politicians had been questioning whether the traditional theory that their politicians' scope for playing games with borrowing and fiscal expansion um, were really constrained by the markets. I remember when I was Chancellor and my opposite number was John McDonnell having these kind of discussions with him where he was quite clear that this was old, old thinking and actually the markets didn't have the power to constrain what governments did. What we saw in response to Kwasi Kwarteng's budget was that the market did have the power to call a limit to what governments can do. And in consequence, I, I don't think we have any politicians in the UK today that are anywhere 
near to power that would think of proposing a more borrowing to fund either tax cuts from the right or massive increases in public spending mm -hmm. from the left. I think the fiscal space is now quite narrowly constrained by the events that happened a year ago. C clearly, one of the ideas behind that budget was, was a, an aim to cut taxes to, to stimulate growth. I just wonder whether, broadly speaking, you think the tax burden is too high. It's at 36% of GDP at the moment. It's due to rise to 38% over the, the next few years, which is the highest since the 1950s. In, in your view, which obviously we should say is, is as a conservative, is there a level which becomes counterproductive of the tax burden? And are we close to that level? Yeah, I think we are. I think that there is a danger that taxation becomes um, so high that it interferes with the normal operation of the economy and it drives people to make investments and to carry out entrepreneurial activity um, elsewhere. The problem, of course, is worse than it sounds because we've also got a demographic profile that is going to see demand for public services pushed still higher. We've got the huge cost of the energy transition to finance. And we've also got to invest more in defence as the world has become a more um, dangerous place around us. But you can't start by borrowing to cut taxes. You've got to start by increasing investment, if necessary, investing more, consuming less, um, in order to grow the economy, improve productivity, so that living standards and um, uh, economic growth can rise uh, over the coming years, and we have a sustainable basis on which to build solidly based public services, public services we can afford. You mentioned net zero there. Um, in an article in The Telegraph recently, in an interview you gave to The Telegraph <coughs> recently, um, which followed the Uxbridge by-election, um, you said, in a democracy, if you fail, you fail to take people with you at your peril. Um, is that taking place at the moment with the aim to get to net zero? Do you think we, we were bringing the people along with that aim and we are now not? Is that, is that what you meant by that phrase? No, I think, um, uh, I've believed for some time that politicians in the UK um, have taken the view, rightly in my view, that um, the energy transition tackling climate change is an urgent priority. And they have forgotten that even though they understand it's an urgent priority, they need to bring the public with them. Because in a democracy, you can only do what the people are prepared to consent to. And it's no good politicians saying, effectively, this is too important to submit it to the democratic process. We have to persuade people that investing in decarbonising our economy rather than growing the size of our economy is what they want to do for the sake of the long-term good of the planet. Mm -hmm. We have to sell that to them. We can't just assume that they will agree with that political judgment. Just finally, to wrap things up, uh, Lord Hammond, I'm sure you've seen the story over the last couple of weeks around rack concrete in schools. Mm. The Prime Minister has been given a bit of grief about that because his time as Chancellor, he could have spent more on, on addressing this and that the uh, Education Department wanted funding for 200 schools to be reassessed and rebuilt. They funded uh, or were willing to fund 50 and, and many fewer than that have actually been completed. Does a Chancellor have to take direct responsibility for decisions like that or is that unfair because there are so many demands on, on, on the public purse? I think it is unfair. Um, uh, you know, the school building programme um, is a capital programme. There are many other demands on available capital and governments have to decide where the priorities are. Demographics is one of the drivers. Um, I, I know this from my own experience. When you look at um, school building requirements, you look not just at what schools we need now, but you look at the um, profile of the population coming through. How many schools are we going to need in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time? Uh, and you're trying to right-size the estate all the time. And uh, I may have missed it, but I'm not aware that we understood this problem in the way that we now understand it at the time um, in question. I don't think we understood it as such an urgent um, uh, safety issue that needed um, to be addressed. And I mean, the Chancellor has said now that he will make um, funds available to deal with the problem, and that's right. But um, you, as, as, as Chancellor, you're constantly making decisions about how to prioritise between different demands for capital funding. And there are always more demands than there are funds available. And it's simply um, trite for people to say afterwards, oh, you should have funded 
a much bigger program over here. I've no doubt there are people also saying we should have spent much more on defence um, over the last few years because look what's happening now in mm -hmm. Ukraine. You make these judgments and then you have to adjust them over time. Lord Hammond, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for stopping Thank by. You.